Trashomaniacs. Geo Gearheads. I'm the Bad Cop, back with Daryl W. Four and a couple of guests for episode 113 of the Geo Gearheads. These guests are the authors of the 101 Devil Caches book and the Mad Casher blog, but we'll get to them in just a few moments. Daryl, I think we should enumerate the schedule for the next couple of shows uh, for our listeners and viewers so they can send in their feedback and mark their very busy calendars in order to watch us live. That uh, sounds like a good plan to me. Uh, next week, March 6th, is a twist on the road caching theme. We're going to talk with a caching couple about their experiences and advice for geocaching from a cruise ship. On the 13th, we're back with another randomized edition. We're talking about batteries again on episode 116 on the 20th. Then on the 27th, uh, with the authors of the uh, Peanuts, Peanuts and Pretzels blog. Boy, I knew I was going to have problems with that. Uh, for a look at their uh, geocaching, their traveling, and, of course, their blogging. You can always email us feedback for any of those shows. That address is geogearheads at cachemaniacs.com, or better yet, you can call those into our voicemail line at 206-350-3647 so we can hear those in your own voice. Of course, you can watch us live through Google Plus or YouTube at 9, 10 p.m. Eastern or 6, 10 p.m. Pacific. If you're on Google Plus, you can even ask us questions through the live Q&A function. Speaking of comments, Taz427 commented on last week's YouTube recording. I missed the live show as I was working on building my 3D printer. Guess what I'm going to be making? And I'm jealous. Uh, anyway, talking about... Uh, anyway about taking items through customs. I had a four and a half inch folding 100th anniversary Boy Scout knife in the front pocket of my fanny pack where I had it on a scout trip uh, the weekend before. And then I traveled to Turkey. I made it through the U.S., German, and Turkish customs with this tossed in my carry-on bag. Nobody stopped me. Uh, then when entering the airport in Turkey where the pre-screen to enter the airport, uh, before the full security scan. The security found it, and had the I had the OMG look on my face, and he smiled and asked, are you going to check this bag? I bobbed my head, indicating that I would should say yes, and, and yes, I checked the bag, and I hate checking bags. <clears throat> now, he says, only one geocache within 100 miles of Xi'an, and that's where the terracotta warriors are in China. He did that one back in 2011. Did a couple of caches in Shanghai as well. That's very cool. Great travel story. And I'm really excited to hear we have another viewer playing in 3D printing. You'll have to keep us posted on how that's going and what you're making. Yeah, your feedback could be something as simple as a, a call on, or this call, I should say, on episode 109. Hey, this is JR and Juju. We'd really like to thank the beers on his on the article on using the OTG USB cable. We use it with a Galaxy S3 and uh, Oregon 450. Sure makes it nice to move a GPX file over. And it's also kind of a safety issue because then you can keep your phone safe and dry. So you, if you have to make an emergency call, it's available. Hey, you guys keep up the good shows. Thank you. Well, and thank you, JR and Juju. That's the type of feedback that keeps us going, and DeBear sends his appreciation as well. That's right. Now we're to the point in the show where we share the answer to last week's question. This time, we're just going to read Jersey Eric's answer. In the days of old, when nights were bold, we used to spin a dial with numbers on the phone in order to dial a number. This was in the days before push-button phones. Since you said this was an easy question, I'm guessing this is the straightforward answer. Why we say dial a number instead of punch in or push in a number. Eric... You're exactly right, as were a dozen other listeners and viewers. But to tell us who won the gift certificate from Cash at Night, let's ask our guest, EJ and Kurt, of the Mad Casher blog. Thanks, and we've been told Code Junkie was drawn as the winner from the dozens of entries. That's exactly right. 
So congratulations, Code Junkie, and we'll get that gift certificate to you right away. Just watch your email. So stay uh, with us through the end of this episode, and we'll have another question and another chance to win another gift certificate from Cash at Night, who we thank for their ongoing continued support. And thank you, EJ and uh, Kurt, for joining us to talk about some of the caches from your 101 Devil Caches book. Last time I spoke with you was almost a year ago on the Geocaching Podcast. That was episode 296. And we found out a lot about the book and you guys there, but could you quickly summarize the book and why you created it? Yeah, so we wrote the book um, because Kurt and I are both uh, fans of those hard-to-find caches that leave you wanting to pull your hair out or going back uh, again and again until you finally find it on the third or fourth try. Um, and so while we had found a lot of uh, unique caches um, in both of our travels kind of across the U.S. and elsewhere, we thought, you know, why don't we memorialize these in one central location? Um, there were some great ideas across the forums and, like I said, on what we had seen. Uh, so that was the intent, was just to spur some ideas and get some even more creative uh, caches out there uh, for us all to find. Now, you said three or four tries from finding some of these caches. You obviously have never been caching with me. There was one cache I think I went back to a dozen different times before I found it. But um, this book is a great way to get some ideas for caches beyond the basic container. Each idea is just a single page in the book, and we'll go over some of those and that we thought might be good inspiration. Daryl, you had the first of those picks. Yeah, the first one that uh, kind of caught my eye was the uh, metal door cache, because in part I've done some of the uh, caches like this. So can you kind of uh, talk with us uh, quickly about uh, what that is and... You know, how you guys uh, came to uh, create the metal door cache? Yeah, I, I can take this one, and then, and Kurt, if you want to jump in. Um, you know, so for my day job, I used to have to drive around in a truck uh, that was uh, had one of those magnets on the side of it with the company's logo and telephone number and uh, DOT number and all that sort of stuff. Um, but at night, I would, I would take it off. Um, and put it in the back seat. And so I kind of got the idea, well, wouldn't it be great if you could put a similar sheet of uh, magnetic vinyl on a metal door to any sort of entranceway, whether it was a auditorium or a, uh, you know, like a back door to a, a restaurant, and then hide a, a log in a Ziploc bag behind that magnetic surface. Um, so that's really the, the idea here is that you would get some magnetic vinyl numbers uh, and put them on a door so that it looked just like the address of that door. And then in a Ziploc bag, you would fold up a piece of sheet for the log and, and kind of tuck that behind the magnetic vinyl piece uh, for the person to find. Yeah, now some of these that i found have been that uh, uh, sticky magnetic material where they'll actually take a sheet of the uh, write in the rain paper, print a log on that, stick that to that side, and then take those utility numbers, stick them to the magnets, you know, the adhesive uh, label ones. And so you have essentially two sets of sticky, but it ends up being a pretty interesting cache that you don't have to have the bag behind, so it ends up uh, sticking pretty well. The only problem I've run into the, uh, with those is because the right in the rain paper is still exposed and it's in that uh, not so dry location. I've have seen mold start to grow on it if it's you mm -hmm. know exposed to the elements. But that's an interesting, fairly easy one. I think uh, almost anyone can put together. I even put one of those together, yeah. and I'm going to tell you a very embarrassing story. I put one of those together, and again, I just put the log right on the back of it, and. Uh, even went and created the page entry, submitted it. It got approved. I went to go hide it, and it was aluminum, not steel. And the magnets wouldn't stick. <laughs> I didn't check that ahead of time. <laughs> that, that is an excellent point. Make sure you know, on any of these that you place, you get the permission, and you've tested it before you go and list it. Yeah, that is a great, a great note. <laughs> now... One the, the first one I chose was the vinyl siding cache on page 61. And I looked at this one going, oh, this is just devious. Because 
you know, the idea is it's not going to stick out at all on the side of the building. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this this is really, <laughs> really devious. And I think I think one of the, the key things with this one is making sure you find um, a, a place that's okay for people to find it. Uh, you don't want to have the coordinates off and they're peering into your neighbor's window. I don't think that that would be... Uh, <laughs> that would be very good, uh, but I think it does offer a lot for people to come up with a lot of interesting hints uh, to see what the responses are when people can't find it, um, and to write back and, and tell them that no, it's 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 there. <laughs> exactly, and I and in all your uh, cash on the pages of your of the book, each cash has an a, a sample. Uh, title or hint to help, you know, the finder get a little clue of where this could be. I really like that idea. Yeah, it's we, we wanted to put in a, a, a couple of hints, but it, really this book is to try to get the, the juices flowing for people to come up with their own their own hints and to be a little creative and add their own spin to, to our ideas. Mm -hmm. Now, the next one I chose was the fake security camera cache. Um, and again, I chose this one just, well, part of my job is, you know, going through and looking at security footage, and boy, if somebody came up and messed with the security camera, I'd be ticked. Yeah, so that, that's a great point. So we sh it's an important note, we mention it several times uh, here in the book, um, you know, but whether it's the security camera or it's, uh, a fake outlet or whatever it might be, you know, safety and public goods should always be at the forefront of everybody's mind if, when they're out geocaching. And so the intent here was, you know, don't go up to a mall and start messing with a security camera to hide a cache in it. The idea would be that you would go out and buy a cheapo old security camera, whether it was through an online service like eBay or uh, maybe at a, a local outlet, I'll take the guts out of it and then mount it so that it was kind of your own creation. You certainly don't want to be causing a security professional like yourself to pull out their hair. Exactly. Well, one of the things that occurred to me is I've actually seen some security cameras that are designed to hide valuables like, you know, little things like rings and necklaces. And as soon as I saw this one, I thought, wow, this is a cache I could even buy off the shelf and uh -huh. use. Yeah, so, you know, Kurt and I came up with a lot of these, like I said, we, we found quite a few uh, through both our individual and cashing together, but a lot of these were, you know, us sitting around with a few adult sodas and some barbecue and thinking about ways to hide things, and I think this one came up of we were literally sitting in a restaurant and looked up and saw this thing and started laughing, and um, I think if, if you had the resources, if you could do this one and still leave the blinking light in place, so that the light was still blinking, I think it would be uh, extra difficult. <laughs> well, there are some of those, uh, you know, prefab fake security cameras that will do just that. So it doesn't seem like it would be all that difficult to do. Mm -hmm. No, actually, I have an old camera that I was taking apart before I read this one, and I looked at it and go, "Yeah, that's exactly what I'm looking at doing." So just to give our listeners an idea of some of the potential hints, on this particular one, the fake security camera, you have a false sense of security, smile, you're on candid camera, or here's looking at you. So now the next one I chose is the very next page, and it's uh, along the exact same lines. It's the alarm bell cache. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, as we're talking about being cognizant of where we're hiding things, uh, one of the very first geocaches I hid uh, was frequented more by police than by geocachers, Oops. and especially people that were trying to find uh, the geocaches at night. Uh, an ammo can next to the building was a poor choice for my first cache. Uh, <laughs> so um, just... Uh, Always be aware of where you hide these things. Um, mm -hmm. But the fire alarm is, is again, one of those uh, in plain sight um, sort of caches. Like the camera, you see them everywhere, but um, seeing one that has a cache in it is rare. And so this is simply just a fire alarm 
bell that has a cache hidden up inside the bell. Again, one of the things to keep in mind with this is to not put it in a location where there could be any danger or obstructing a real bell that would need to go off in case of emergency. Yeah, one of the things that occurred to me, this is, again, kind of what I call one of those found item caches. And I've seen some of these uh, alarm bells for various things at some of the uh, garage sales and auctions you know, that actually say, you know, no longer works. So that would be a perfect thing to pick up for, you know, a couple of bucks and you know, convert into a cash. Absolutely. Right. Now, the next one that I picked is actually the fake snowball cash, and I, this is one I just had to pick with all the snow that we've had in this area recently. And a lot of areas are suffering uh, simil similarly. So tell us uh, what this cash actually is. Yeah, so I think the polar, polar vortex has uh, kind of caught a lot of people off guard, and Kurt and I are both from Maine, so when people talk about polar vortex, and in Maine we just call that winter. Um, <laughs> but so what this is is, again, and this is going to be one of those caches that may be good for a month. It may be good for a week, uh, depending on where you hide it and how much snow you get it. But the idea of this one is to basically create something that looks like a fake chunk of snow. Um, and so how I thought this one would be built uh, w was to take some of that uh, spray foam insulation, the expanding insulation, and just spray on your workbench a, a big glob of it, let it expand and solidify, um, do its thing, and come back later and uh, drill an epoxy, a bison tube into it and then spray it uh, white with either uh, white spray paint or even better, they have that um, acoustical stuff that they used to put on the old ceilings that you can get in a spray paint can now. Um, put that on it and then literally go hide it out in a snowbank or um, somewhere where um, it would be able to be found for a little while. You know, if you put it in a snowbank, it might disappear in the next snowstorm, but camouflage it really well. Yeah, I would have to think if you put it in uh, anything close to a parking lot, it would have the tendency to move either by people uh, playing with it or by the snowplows uh, moving it around inadvertently. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this one uh, is definitely one that would... It's, it's kind of like that pile of rocks uh, type of cache, I guess, that would take someone uh, quite a long time, and especially with the cold weather, I'm not mm -hmm. sure how much time people would want to spend on it. So definitely a deviled cache. Yeah, and I, I think Kurt said it perfect. The cache that's hidden in plain sight is often the hardest one to find. I know there are some caches that people can walk right up to and find, and uh, to your example of a fake rock cache amongst a, a pile, there was one cache that was literally just one of those uh, key holders uh, on the outlet of the culvert that I think I went back to half a dozen times before I found it, and the last time I literally walked right up to it and was beside myself that I hadn't seen it before. Nice. I had one that was a, it was next to railroad tracks, and there was a large spike in the tree, and well, in, in one of the telephone poles next to the railroad tracks, and you actually had to pull the spike out of the, um, out of the telephone pole, and they had hollowed it out and attached the bison tube to the end of it. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, those ones near uh, railroad right-of-ways always worry me because people have the tendency to think railroads aren't active when they actually are. Yes. Yes, indeed. Well, the next cache that uh, we're going to talk about actually came from one of our listeners who tweeted us. And this is from uh, Limax, or Limax, uh, who said, I haven't had a chance to implement any of them yet but I found the animal hides quite intriguing. So we're going to talk about the scary log cache on page 109. Yeah, th these are my favorite caches in the book, actually. Um, this, uh, the one on page 109 talks about having a, you know, a fake rat or, or plastic rat. I am more along the lines of, I want full taxidermy. Uh, <laughs> because wow. that would be that would be very very scary if you could get it in a place uh, in the elements that that wouldn't get it too much. But I think a full taxidermied uh, animal in a in a scary uh, position inside of a log 
or what have you would would deter most from uh, from going to get it. Uh, hopefully, you know, they would return uh, maybe a second <laughs> time and realize the animal hadn't moved and, and figure out what it was. But even even then, once they get it, they may wish they hadn't, uh, <laughs> depending on what you choose. But uh, but this is definitely one of my more um, favorite caches in the book. It'd be one well, of those. this is basically uh, taking a fake animal, hiding it in the log so that it's protected, you know, hollowed out log. And I actually ran into one of these a long time ago that was a skunk. And, of course, <laughs> I saw it. I'm like, okay, I'm not going near that thing. I'm going to walk away because I don't want to wake him up. And then, of course, 20 minutes later realized, uh, yeah, that's the actual cache inside that fake skunk. <laughs> that's great. Make sure it's a large yeah, cache. Have- because you're going to need to place clean underwear in the container. <laughs> I, I, and the other thing, too, to note there is, uh, you know, as I said before, both Kurt and I grew up in Maine where uh, no poisonous spiders or snakes. Um, but certainly people want to be careful if they're sticking their uh, their arms in and things like that. They want to make sure that there's nothing in there for real. Mm-hmm. And if we if we leave underwear in there, just don't, don't leave any likable items. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I did, replace. I did find a cache one time where you had to cross a log over a uh, river and in the cache was a clean dry pair of socks in case you didn't make it over the river or across the log I mean so That's <laughs> that very was cool. a nice touch <laughs> now I chose another one page 112 bag of pennies cash just for the evil nature of it. Um, there's a cash in my area that's similar. It's, uh, it's a large uh, garbage can full of um, uh, uh, 35 millimeter film canisters. And only one of the film canisters has, you know, the, the real log in it for you to sign. This is a, a pretty much the same idea. Yeah, so the idea behind this one came to us uh, growing up and still to this day. I I collect change, and I don't ever seem to cash it in. So growing up, I always had big jars full of pennies. And the idea behind this one is you would put 10 to, you know, 15 $20 worth of pennies in a bag, and you would also find a uh, copper blank. Um, and, you know, this the way I envisioned it, this would be part of a multi-cash uh, and on that blank, you would uh, engrave the coordinates of the final cache location, but the person would literally have to go through uh, and try to find that that one blank. Yeah, and one of the things that occurred to me with this one is leaving a bag of pennies out there is probably pretty pricey. And as soon as that occurred to me, there was a, a posting on the uh, on one of the you know funny websites of a bag of 50 pennies, fake pennies, for $3.50 on sale. (laughs) So pennies are probably cheaper than getting the fake pennies. Wow. Or you could go out and be like those people that just found $10 million of gold coins in in a rusty can on their property. Oh, boy, don't you, don't we all wish we were those guys? I yeah. grabbed my shovel and started digging holes in my backyard. It hasn't happened yet. Yeah. <laughs> That's quite the that'd be quite the geocache there. Hey, look what I found. <laughs> wow. Retirement. <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah. So basically this is one of those uh, you know what we used to call the patient style caches where you're gonna take uh, you know, all of these pennies out. You have to look at each and every one because one of them is going to be a blank that has the coordinates to the next stage on it. Mm-hmm. So definitely, uh, definitely going to take you a little while. Now the next uh, I came across is one that I've seen a few of around, called the uh, Dead Language Cache, which is on uh, page one eighteen. Yeah, I think the the whole idea here is to, uh, you know, really confuse people where they they know that it's a you know hidden message sort of thing. You know, where's my decoder ring in my oval team to try to figure it out? Um, what makes it really devious is by not telling them what language they're looking at and requires them almost, I mean, they're going to have to come back um, to, to figure it out because they're not going to know what language it is. And, 
you know, what I like about this one is, you know, you could look at it as an educational experience where they're going to go learn something in order to solve it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if it was me, I, I actually probably wouldn't call it the dead language cache. I would just call it something generic. And then when they get out there and saw um, Sanskrit, um, <laughs> you know, they, they might curse a little bit and have to come back. <laughs> yeah, most of these, when I've seen them, it's been uh, glyph fonts. So they're actually using something like uh, web dings. They'll post <laughs> it right on the page, and you just have to, you know, they'll take a screenshot and post the graphic so that you can't just, you know, convert it on the web. Copy and paste, sure. Exactly. Uh, but I have seen some of them where if you're using a web face like wing dings, or web dings, rather, uh, you can actually just do that, copy, paste, and you get the numbers out. So it can be pretty simple or it can be pretty hard. And it's a great, easy way to come up with a, a puzzle cache if you wanted to uh, play with that and see how many people will do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was uh, there was one cache uh, that kind of got me, and I, I keep thinking about it every time I think about actually placing this one, um, of putting it out there with no hint that this is going on. There was one uh, cache, and I can't remember the name of it, uh, in uh, central New York State where it was like a three-mile hike in. Um, got all the way in there, opened it up, and it's a web address, and there was no cell phone coverage uh, where this <laughs> where this cache was. So you had to hike all the way back out, find find a, a cell service that you go on your smartphone, and then hike back up after you got the coordinates off the website. Oh, no. That's, that's pretty nasty. <laughs> There's a difference between devil and just mean. <laughs> like the space station one. I mean, who's going to get that, you know? Um, yeah. Astronauts. <laughs> yeah. That one Russian guy's like, yes, I finally got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next one I chose is the Lost Dog Cache, and I thought this was brilliant because you simply put up a poster with the coordinates of a multi-cache hidden into it, you know, in, embedded into it. And it's simply the picture of a, of a lost dog. Yeah, yeah I mean, we... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, I mean, everybody sees these all over town, unfortunately, with people losing or, or misplacing their pets temporarily. Um, and so it occurred to me, you know, most of the ones that are made to last are sitting in those uh, plastic sheets. Um, and so why not put up a a picture of a dog with a fake number and the name of Muggles, um, and then write on the back of the sheet or uh, seal the plastic up, and, and then, yeah, as you mentioned, put the coordinates to the next step in that, that cache there. So again, hiding it in plain sight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that idea. Well, it wouldn't necessarily even have to be uh, for a pet. It could be anything you really wanted to do. I'm thinking, you know, even Garage lost sale. GPS... Well, I'm thinking, yeah, mm -hmm. you could do a crash up. I'm thinking, you know, lost GPS, uh, if found, return to these coordinates. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's perfect. Yeah, especially in a uh, not quite so high traffic area, that might work a little bit better. Or, well, I shouldn't say better, but a little bit more uh, amusing for the uh, finders. All right, and our last one that we're going to hit tonight is one that I've actually done, one of my favorite. Not done as in hid, but one that I've actually uh, found. Uh, and you guys call this the uh, Picture This Cache. It's on page 135 of the book. And the one that I did was called Pick Tour. And boy, that one really got me into caching in a major way. So tell us more about this uh, Picture This type of cache. Yeah, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let EJ handle this one. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the idea of this one is, and I'm not sure if it's exactly the same as the one that you're referencing, though I, I do want to hear that story, um, was that you would take a, a photo of a general location where the cache might be, um, and then you would, uh, there's a couple ways you could do it. So there's ways to embed messages in photos, so you could do it digitally that way, or um, on your cache listing, you could list coordinates with missing digits um, and then give the actual file name um, numbers in it that would then plug into that final coordinate. Yeah, the one that I did was more like that last type 
where you're given this series of, I want to say it was actually 14 images. I think they made you go out and find each and every digit, you know, degrees, minutes, and decimals, everything. And they give you a hint for each one of those photos. What you had to do was find the location that that photo had been taken and then read the hint to find what that number was. So it took us a good two or three hours at least of wandering around the city, and we got a really good look at the architecture because we were looking for those little details. So I really enjoyed that one because it gave us a chance to walk around and get a better look at uh, you know what the city had to offer and some of its more unique aspects. Very cool. Yeah, now those I tried to put one together in one of the small cities around here and did have much luck. Uh, finding that many interesting sites that you could actually use for hints didn't turn out so well for me. <laughs> Just tell so it does take a, some skill. Tell some people there's a, there's a cache at the bottom of the money pit at Oak Island and maybe we'll find out what's there. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> oh, such fun. Now, this is a, a good uh, look at some of the uh, uh, caches. We've only done 10 of the 101, and you can get a whole bunch of uh, really good ideas, uh, much like we've talked about tonight, uh, you know, variances on these kind of uh, uh, caches. So tell people how they can actually get a hold of this book if they want to go and grab a copy now and get some more ideas. Yeah, so there's uh, the easiest way is to just go on through Amazon. Uh, you can find it there. Uh, just search for 101 geocaches, it'll come up. Um, and the other way is it's also available as, a, as an ebook through uh, Kindle. Uh, the great thing about that is that we've made the book available uh, as part of the free lending library. So anybody out there that has Amazon Prime and has a Kindle reading device, you can go in and check out the book, uh, look through it, uh, and then return it. Um, at no cost to you. We do get a, a small royalty for that. Um, and I would certainly encourage you if you want to uh, really dig into what the book's meant for to buy a hard copy so you can make notes. But if you just want to check it out and you have access to that, go, go check it out. It doesn't cost you anything. Excellent. And we'll, of course, link to uh, uh, the website in the show notes as well. Now, next week, we're going to be back with our show about uh, geocaching from a cruise ship. We've got another randomized show, followed by batteries, and on the 27th, Peanuts and Pretzels will join us for another road caching show. Now, next week, we'll have another one of these cool Cash at Night glow-in-the-dark coins for the lucky person who can tell us who operates the GPS satellites. Email geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com with the subject question 114 then in the body include your geocaching.com name and your answer by 3 p.m. Pacific on March 5th check the Cashamaniacs website at cashamaniacs.com for more on the geo gearheads including show notes for this and all of our episodes we'd love hearing from our listeners so leave us feedback by calling 206-350-3647 by emailing geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com or through social media your support helps keep the Cash Maniac shows coming. Please consider making a PayPal donation through the link on our website to support the Cash Maniac shows. Geo Gear has is produced by Chris Offenauer and Daryl Weinberg. This show is copyright 2014 by Daryl Weinberg. All rights reserved. Cash with the Cash Maniacs.